the discussion is on Beetlejuice? Yes. Where would we like to start? I want to start with a comparison to Coraline. To Coraline? All right, go ahead. <laughs> um, same, Tim Burton seems to have this running theme of child neglect in a way and displacement. There's an adjustment disorder issue possibly going on and parents who are not paying attention again, same theme. And um, same way, child who sees things. Well, there's a dis uh, the difference there being Coraline, it was a character, the other parent is not necessarily friendly at the end of it, but here the other parents become friendly and they're taking care of the, so there's a same but not the same that Tim Burton is kind of bringing up. Rurals, same movement, you know, mm -hmm. being displaced into the rural environment. Something about loneliness. So, so in our main character, um, in this case, we're focusing on the child. Her, her Lydia. name? Lydia. 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 Um, there appears to be uh, childhood neglect, and what then is likely an adaptive mechanism for children, which is fantasy. Uh, may become maladaptive. Right. So again, fantasy as a defense is the autistic retreat into an inner world that protects the individual from the anxiety created by the external world. That, that's fantasy. That's fantasy and therefore that's fantasy play. And to the extent that fantasy or any other defense mechanism for that matter accomplishes its goal, it's constructive. Right. And perhaps we've all been there. I don't know if you guys remember how you acted when you were three or four or five. Uh, but again, imaginary friends and tea parties are, are real to the person and are constructive. On the other hand, if there is some form of childhood trauma, that constructive mechanism can certainly become destructive. Uh, and that would include perhaps being age inappropriate. Do we know how old Lydia is? She's still, like in high school maybe, because they show her going to school. Yeah, that's so middle she, school. Right. She's even older than Coraline. Yeah. So th this would be concerning if we had this character present us with a chief complaint of blank, fill in the blank with a plot of Beetlejuice. Uh, because of her age, we, we would certainly address this differently than if she were 10 years younger. So that, that part is a concern. Uh, nonetheless, we still would have to get at the root cause, which does seem to be child neglect. Okay. Unfortunately, and again, I'm, I'm gonna probably stop here because we're talking too much about child and Muslim psychiatry, something I'm just not credential to talk about. But unfortunately, once you identify and correct the problem, the children's behavior, the child's behavior does not spontaneously remit. It just doesn't work like that. So, uh, but we, we do see some form of, well, we'll talk about the ending when we talk about the ending. Um, any other ideas with regard to this childhood development type of um, perspective of Lydia and of Beetlejuice? So she does have an imaginary friend, right? Again, if, if she came to you with a report of seeing a ghost, um, if you're on call and if I'm your attending on call, there's zero chance you're going to tell me there's nothing to do here, but maybe get an exorcist and get the ghost out of the house or ghost hunters or whoever. Um, you'd have a difficult time passing your clerkship if you did that. Mm -hmm. So this sound, sounds like it's fantasy. This sounds like an imaginary friend. Now sometimes, again, there's not great consistency here, but some, if not most, of the time, attributes of whatever the conflict is are manifest in the imaginary friend. Coraline, my mother is not perfect, I'm gonna create the perfect scenario, right? Um, because that's where I want my reality to be. Of course, the inverse also happens where I can't tolerate the negative attributes of my mom, so I'm gonna have an imaginary friend that imbues all of those negative attributes, AKA the evil stepmother. Mm -hmm. So it could, it could work in either direction. What's going on with Lydia's imaginary friend? And does that shed any light on what her conflict may be? Um, I think like for, I'm really bad with names, but for the two 
two um, ghost parents, essentially, they like really want a child, but they can't seem to have one. Um, and her own parents, it, it again didn't seem like they really wanted her. So like the feeling of wanting to be like wanted or needed. Um, and I think it definitely played a role because I, I think at one point she was, or she attempted to like, commit suicide. And, yeah, she was writing out a letter. And I can't remember the exact content of the letter, but it's like, you will find me once you're reading this. Um, you jump, jump off the, the bridge. bridge. Jump plummet it. Plummet it. Plummet it. In that context, it, it sounds like there's even a stronger similarity to Coraline uh, with regard to Lydia's other parents wanting her. That's the wish. Um, and certainly, that's also a struggle with Coraline that is acknowledging that my parents wished I was never born. That's why why born is a, her imaginary friend. Many of us don't think why born is actually a real character in Coraline. It's an imaginary friend. Very similar. Right? So both little girls are struggling with why they were born and if their parents truly wanted them. Of course, that means my imaginary friend, my imaginary parents, will be those that never were able to have kids and of course cherish every moment they have with me. So another, another parallel with, with Coraline. Um, there's also elements of suicide as well, uh, certainly in Beetlejuice. And we talked about the darker side of Coraline too and what might be going on there in as much as it might be a fictional case of Munchausen's by proxy. Right? We discussed that, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, there, there's also um, uh, some, I don't want to say vague, but certainly uh, a short reference to an auto automobile accident that happened in the past. And when, when you look at that, might there be something going on in the home where suicide or suicidal behavior or perhaps even parasuicidal behavior would have to be considered. So we, we have similar themes shared in the two films there too. What else about Beetlejuice, the film? unadulterated it there's no super ego to this ghost and this movie was actually selected to again demonstrate the signs and the symptoms of mania I mean very impulsive um, and um, rapid speech flight of ideas uh, distractible um, he's mad and, and whether or not he's ever had a depressive episode is irrelevant he has bipolar one disorder unless we, we think that this is due to the direct physiologic effects of a substance, an underlying medical condition, or three, what illness? Schizoaffective. Schizoaffective disorder, bipolar type, good. Anything to suggest any of those three? So let, let's work through this, this clinically. So number one, with regard to a substance-induced mania, in the script, is there any overt evidence that there is a substance written into this movie? He keeps eating beetles, which um, some might have some relationship to it. But Maybe metaphorically, but discreetly, is yeah. this about substance use? The answer is no. The follow-up question is, does, does the absence of discrete information then reassure you that Beetlejuice isn't about a substance-induced Bipolar disorder? The answer is no, because the answer will always be no. Uh, clinicians should always operate with a high clinical level of suspicion. So that states, period. So, but it's important to understand why it states. It doesn't stay because as a clinician you're a jerk and you rubber stamp everybody as an addict. That's not what we're doing here, right? Second question, similar application, but underlying medical condition. Is there discrete evidence in this movie that Beetlejuice the film 
actually includes a medical condition in the character. No. no. You could review that script as close as you want. It doesn't say that Beetlejuice the ghost has a medical condition. Follow up question. Does the absence of discrete evidence suggest or reassure that therefore Beetlejuice the film isn't about a bipolar illness due to an underlying medical condition? And the answer again is a little bit more tentative here, whereas for substance we, we quickly say nope because we never say yes. Here I want to look at some risk factors. What are the two risk factors that we're going to focus on primarily? With regard to an underlying organic etiology inducing a mental disorder? Age. Age and? Gender. Good. That's sex. Right. right? So an older man has two risk factors. A young woman actually has two protective factors. I'm not going to talk about the two intermediates. Right? The two intermediates will not show up on your exam. If this were a young woman with your case vignette on your exam demonstrating no abnormal lab values, or physical exam findings, you can assume health. That is good physical health status. Not true for the older man or, or male. In, in the older male, the absence should not reassure. You still should operate with a high clinical index of suspicion that what you're seeing with regard to mental health is in fact induced by a medical condition. Now the intermediates are going to come up in clinical practice and the way you address them is going to be up to you. You can address them as a young female or an older male. It really depends on you choose to practice medicine. This is an older male. So there may be something here, even in the absence of discrete information. And that means we have to keep this in our differential. Uh, perhaps even higher than substance use. So with that context, are there any, anything in this movie that might be metaphorical now? So we went discreetly, does anything really truly, is there anything truly in print in the script? The answer is an obvious no. But since he is an older male, anything metaphorical that we could kind of draw out and say, hmm, this even heightens my suspicion or supports the idea that we in fact do need to keep this in our differential? before about um, like impulsive like sexual affections like he maybe like frontal temporal issues like dementia because of because he would always like respond to things in a very sexual way or like another like, like another way thought that potentially could be yeah that's a good point um, and I, I don't think we go much further in this discussion without him, him getting a CT scan <laughs> yeah right uh, which is likely to come back with chronic changes of anything well he's but 50s, so maybe not chronic changes, but certainly at best that, or at most of that. Um, probably not much more there, uh, but I'm concerned that his frontal lobe is compromised. Yep, I agree. Um, I'm wondering, the scene, actually towards the, the end, right, where he has his head shrunk, which by the way itself is very metaphorical, I want to talk about that. Um, might that have been a clue by the producer, by the director, of what the etiology of his frontotemporal dementia, dementia may be? Like particle like atrophy? Like small. Well, again, um, I, mean, I think I have to would include that, right? Because of, of the head shrinking, you mean? Yeah. Cortical atrophy. Remember who's in the waiting room with them. So what would the clinician inquire? Who, um, you mean the guys, the, there was a hunter on one side and then the... Uh, oh, Is it that? The one that, who sprinkles the dust on him. Yeah. So it's there's the, some substance element there. What? So it's a C. It's like you die from it really fast. Yeah. 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 Uh, I mean... My, I mean, you have to ask. I, I don't think it's fair to assume, but you have to ask whether or not uh, your tribe actually includes cannibalism or has ritualistic cannibalism, right? 
Now, in addition to that, we do see a substance, one that literally shrinks his head. I'm not sure what that substance is, but that sounds like it might, might have been a shaman. And what's sprinkled then is medicinal. So we have to consider that. So all of a sudden, the substance-induced psychotic disorder, or excuse me, bipolar disorder might go a little higher in a differential just because of that final scene where um, uh, CJD, as well as a toxin-induced mental disorder, um, uh, might be demonstrated here. Microcephaly secondary to fetal alcohol syndrome. So, um, this is like a long term. what I would need to do is really get a differential of microcephaly in general. Uh, and although fetal alcohol syndrome would be in that differential, um, I'm not so sure there's supporting evidence to that. Uh, I, don't, I don't see the thin upper lip, the missing uh, philtrum, the low set ears, the wide set eyes, the hypertilarism. None of that really exists here. So without that uh, stereotypical facies, uh, I don't know how high my differential FAS really would be. Uh, but um, if you're going to go again with the metaphor of microcephaly, you, you certainly have something with regard to physical health status that might support this. That is, what ails Beetlejuice as due to an underlying medical condition? And again, the impulsivity is going to be front, uh, frontotemporal, right? It's going to be front, frontal lobe pathology, impulse, right? Weak superego. Superego is localized in the frontal lobe, right? And impulsivity then is uh, not tempered. It's not, it's, it's not, uh, it is not temporized. And therefore, the individual, in this case the ghost, will act on his urges, his impulses. Now, again, I don't know if this is a true um, impulse control disorder versus a bipolar disorder. Uh, I certainly would suggest that we have to think this is due to bipolar. Impulsivity is in fact uh, part of the definition, right? Uh, and he does demonstrate other signs of mania as well. Again, uh, flight of ideas, rapid speech, um, etc. So again, this ghost does appear to be afflicted with um, a bipolar or related disorder. Any idea of the time frame here? As in the, uh, what period it is? Uh, what duration of time we are observing everything unfold? Over the course of a couple of weeks, I would say, at least. Yeah. So if it's a couple of weeks, it's mania. Right? If, it was, if it's less than seven days, it probably is going to be hypomania. Uh, although, even if I mean, how do you differentiate dig fast, right? That's the DSM criteria for a manic episode that is less than seven days, um, either being a hypomanic episode versus um, a manic episode that you just happen to catch early in its course. So it happens to impair function on your Yeah, that's it, right? Um, does this impair functioning? Mm -hmm. Or um, do you? Yeah. Social function. Socially is. Yeah. Yeah, well, I would say yes. Yeah, and again, remember, even though we're saying for the individual, right. other person's accounts count. Right? So even though he might say, I'm perfectly fine, get away from me, when we hear people around them say, wait a minute, uh, there is significant interpersonal dysfunction here. Um, I don't think it's kicked out of the, this, well, the afterlife. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was the Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is this is mania. Right. This is this is this is mania. It's clinically significant. It does go beyond seven days. But even hypothetically, if it hadn't, uh, working this through, it's only because we have not observed it long enough. Right. Um, it is clinically significant, and unfortunately, we wouldn't reassure the individual who we see at day four. Well, this is called hypomania, um, because upon being asked the question, how do you know that if we meet next week, I'm still not like this, then you're gonna change your diagnosis, Doc? Well, the level of impairment suggests that that is exactly what would happen. What else with that? Anything else? I like the theme of group delusion or group hallucination. Um, 
So like, if you're t talking points of view from the original house owners who died, then you, couldn't, you might be able to say that everything that's happening in the movie is part of their delusion. And the fact that they're having the same delusion means it's something like the um, cause of folly of you, yeah. where like a dominant um, individual, with, individual with the delusion transfers that belief to the, um, the subject. But is, is Lydia dominant? Um, so I was talking about the two, uh, the wife and the husband. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 All right. Yep. And you know, the American Psychiatric Association is getting away from this terminology with regard to fully to do. Mm -hmm. um, by the way, it doesn't have to occur only within or among two people. It could be three, four, and period, right? Um, it, it also could occur in a family, all right? So uh, I'm, I'm not up to my French, but um, fully familiar. Um, and then there's even a, um, a variant of this where it isn't transferred. It just occurs spontaneously in both at the same time. Uh, fully uh, simultaneous. Right? Again, I'm, I'm having a, probably an Italian pronunciation of the French term. Simultaneous. So what else about Beetlejuice? I, I do want to get to one other aspect of this movie, but I want to make sure that everybody's observations and questions are addressed. Anything else? I mean, I think there's definitely something to be said about how you have to say his name three times to, like, I don't know if that's just a quirk of a movie, or it's too obviously OCD. I, I don't, I'm not sure what. I would go with OCD. Like, are I, they trying to be obvious that, or, or is it I, I, in something? I would be absolutely OK with OCD. <laughs> I mean, th this need to reach a certain number, repetitive tasks. Uh, in this case, it's, it, I mean, it's, it's very metaphorical because in OCD, it alleviates anxiety. And that is, if you don't do it three times, whether it's knock before you go through a door, count, et cetera, the anxiety uh, intensifies. Um, this is a little bit of a different spin on it, but certainly uh, suggests obsessive compulsive disorder. Right, so obsessive compulsive disorder is an anxiety disorder. The anxiety disorders have been reclassified into three separate chapters, one of which happens to be titled the obsessive compulsive and related disorders. The hallmark illness in this new chapter happens to be obsessive compulsive disorder or OCD. Individuals with this condition, that is anybody who has to say Beetlejuice three times, has clinically significant obsessions and or compulsions. And that really is it. There's, there's not much more to the definition than clinically impairing obsessions, compulsions, or both. The other illness I want to just refer to here is the one that was brought up earlier than, than even earlier before that because we were talking about uh, deficits in impulse control, uh, impulse control disorders. And while we identified two, pyromania and kleptomania, as impulse control disorders, there's another, trichotillomania, that was previously classified as a disorder of impulse control, but has since been reclassified as an obsessive compulsive slash related, uh, related disorder. That is. It's in the new chapter. It is a disorder related to OCD. And that's trichotillomania. And then even if we go back to yesterday's discussion, another condition in this new chapter is called body dysmorphic disorder, where an individual has a, um, a preoccupation with an imagined defect in appearance, formerly referred to as a type of somatoform disorder. But as of the new publication, the new revision to the DSM, specifically the DSM-5, has been reallocated to the chapter of the obsessive compulsive and related disorder. So you have OCD as the clear gold standard illness, and then the related disorders that we've discussed over the past 24 hours include body dysmorphic disorder, trichotillomania,
and, and um, I'm just blanking on the last one we just talked about. Uh, Pyromania is still in the impulse control disorder chapter. Uh, I'm, bl I'm blanking on it. You know, it's going to come to me as soon as we go off, off the subject. Okay. Any other thoughts about the issues? Why does he have to marry Lydia? Is there like anything to that, or like why was that first created? And I thought that came out of the but that was his only way of staying permanent in the world. That's what I thought it was. Yeah, that yeah. was it. That was, I feel like it just came out of the world. Uh, yeah, I just think, I think it, well, I can't even it say it was a form of manipulation. It wasn't, he didn't manipulate anything. He just was very impulsive and coerced her. Yeah. I, I'm not sure if there's an easy parallel there with psychiatry or, or to reach a psychiatric or uh, behavioral teaching point. I want to talk about the final scene with regard to his head shrinking because I, uh, as, a, as a shrink myself, um, it's important to recognize that, at least metaphorically, Beetlejuice gets treated at the end, right? Um, and if he gets treated and his mania subsides, that treatment most likely incorporated a, a group of medications referred to as the mood stabilizers. So for acute mania, um, the idea is that if the mania is mild to moderate. Now we're talking about clinically significant mania in either case. Mild to moderate mania, monotherapy with a mood stabilizer, first line lithium or valproic acid. Severe mania, especially severe mania that incorporates psychotic features, dual therapy including a mood stabilizer and an antipsychotic. General practice on how to treat acute mania. Lithium. Lithium is a naturally occurring salt. Anybody know what number on the periodic table? Three. All over that one. <laughs> uh, interestingly, yeah. Beetlejuice, 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 lithium. So maybe he did get actually treated after all. And then with the sprinkles, it was like alcoholic acid sprinkles? Yep. <laughs> alcoholic acid does come in sprinkles. So he's on dual therapy. Interestingly, um, if you don't think he's psychotic, that would suffice. If you think he actually demonstrates some form of psychosis within the context of his bipolar illness, um, that second medication should have been an antipsychotic. Uh, lithium is, is definitely approved, FDA approved for acute mania. It also is often used in bipolar depression, although it does not have FDA approval. Um, it does have the endorsement by the American Psychiatric Association, though. In the APA treatment guidelines, lithium is actually endorsed as a first-line therapy for bipolar depression, even, even though it is being used or would be used off-label, that is, without FDA approval. Lithium side effects include nephrotoxicity, and that could include diabetes insipidus as a result. So be very, very careful of any bipolar case on your shelf that also deals with hypernatremia. Look for the lithium. There are four medications that are secreted through the kidney that psychiatrists will routinely prescribe. One is lithium. What are the other three? So if you're I have to look that up. I know about the stones, but I don't know if it's precipitates. I have, to, I have to double check that. If you remember, the kidney is a bean-shaped organ. B E A N gives you the four, right. with E being escalate, which is what you B. Use for own. Use for own. We have the E escalate. That's lithium. A used in addiction medicine. Acamprosate? Perfect, acamprosate. And then N is a brand name used in neurology for neuropathic pain. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, for neurontin. Neurontin or gabapentin. Yeah. Those are the four that most commonly come up on shelf exams. The other way lithium presents with regard to nephrotoxicity 
is when an individual presents lithium toxic. So we're dealing with not only therape therapeutic blood levels, but more importantly, a narrow therapeutic index. That is, the difference between the therapeutic level and the toxic level is very, very small. For acute mania, we strive for around 0.8. Maintenance therapy is about half of that, 0.4 to 0.6. And certainly toxicity at 1.2. That's the upper limit of normal. Somebody comes in with symptomatic lithium toxicity. Next best step on your shelf exam. Oh. I was just gonna say fluids. Fluids, no. Symptomatic. Symptomatic lithium toxicity. Yes, the Levage, nope. No. Diuretics. Diuretics. Milk. Make it worse. Hemo hemodialysis. Uh, Symptomatic lithium toxicity gets hemodialysis. Again, very common test question. Um, gastric lavage, inactivated charcoal, will be choices A and B. Skip that. Lithium level gets the steady state in five days. And we have routine lab monitoring every three to four months including follow-up lithium levels, creatinine, sensitive TSH for lithium-induced hypothyroidism, and then even calcium for lithium-induced hypercalcemia. If an individual comes back with a sensitive TSH that is elevated, what is the next best step in terms of lab monitoring? <coughs> Good, free T4, okay? If the free T4 is low, low. next best step. Levothyroxine? Yeah, levothyroxine. This is one of the few examples in medicine where we medicate the side effect. Uh, if, and your clinical vignette will have a stable bipolar patient. Now, if they're unstable, please stop the lithium because it's not working. But if you're getting efficacy from the medication, specifically the lithium, and there's lithium-induced hypothyroidism, treat the hypothyroidism, so your patient will be on both lithium and levothyroxine. Valproic acid, sprinkles. It's given PO, but it can be given in sprinkles for people who can't tolerate PO. Uh, this is an anti-epileptic drug, or AED. This medication, like most psychotropics, are metabolized through the liver. We usually do get a level that is day four. But unlike lithium, the levels are not established for psychiatry. They're established for neurology and seizure prophylaxis. So if your patient is asymptomatic with a subtherapeutic level, the answer is to do nothing. You don't adjust the medication, the psychotropic, when your patient has no more signs of mania with a subtherapeutic 50 to 125 sub-therapeutic valproic acid level. The time to actually get a valproic acid level thereafter is when the patient is demonstrating toxicity at optimized or low doses, or the inverse, lack of efficacy at optimized or maximum doses. So when things aren't going according to plan, check the level. Otherwise, do not routinely get valproic acid levels after four days. What sorts of things would you see? Like what sorts of symptoms demonstrate toxicity? Toxicity for valproic acid looks similar to alcohol intoxication. Individuals who have slurred speech, impaired gait, um, will appear over sedated with nystagmus. Also for side effect, and again, this doesn't have to occur with toxic levels, it can happen at therapeutic doses, but hepatitis drug-induced hepatitis. So check AST and ALT every three to four months. Also check a platelet count with your AST and ALT because of uh, acrylic acid-induced thrombocytopenia. The other thing this medication can do is increase serum ammonia. Um, 
but we don't get routine ammonia levels. Uh, we see this often in the hospital where an individual is delirious, and we're wondering whether or not it's hyperammonia-induced uh, delirium, and therefore we look at the vocalic acid as perhaps inducing that, so we get the, um, the ammonia level then. So when clinically indicated, think of ammonia level, ammonia levels are not part of the routine lab, the routine lab monitoring, however. ASD, ALT, play the count. They are. Always talk to your patients about birth control on both lithium and vaproic acid, uh, especially with women of childbearing years. The test question for lithium is going to focus on the Epstein's anomaly, which occurs in about 1 to 2% of uh, patients, right around 1% of women. It's the atrialization of the um, right cardiac valve. The point prevalence is, is, is low enough, but always counsel on birth control. The proic acid induced neural tube defects occur much more often, about 10 times as often, as the Epstein's anomaly. So, birth control for women of childbearing age treated with the proic acid as well. It does not appear that folic acid supplements reduce the risk. Sounds nice. Make, certainly shows that we're reading the textbook, but not necessarily protective. Questions about lifting or, or about folic acid? Questions about bipolar? If a, someone's pregnant and they were on BPA before and you find out, what do you do? Good, great question. So if an individual is maintained and stabilized on either lithium or valproic acid, uh, the first step in therapy upon discovering that they are pregnant is to continue care. Uh, the idea here would be that the individual is stabilized and you would prefer not to discontinue the medication. And to do this, you need an informed patient to provide informed consent. So ultimately, the patient will decide. If there's a compromise, it's holding the medication for the first trimester until the, um, the fetal heart cases of lithium, um, or the fetal brain, in cases of aprolic acid, are developed. And then somewhere around the second trimester, restarting the medication. Albeit still with some level of risk of uh, teratogenicity. On the other hand, if your patient says, nope, no medications at all for pregnancy, uh, whether it's because they really don't work all that well to begin with, or they do, but the risk simply does not justify these benefits. What is, the, what is the first therapy you should discuss with your patient at this point for your board exam? And the answer is not the next FDA approved drug called carbamazepine. So I'll give you a hint right there. It's not, it's not carbamazepine. Hmm? Lamotrigine. Lamotrigine, no. Clozapine? no. Kepra? Kepra, no. CBT? CBT, close, no. It rhymes with CBT. ECT. ECT. You got my joke, that's good. <laughs> you got a great sense of humor, I can tell. <laughs> Electroconvulsive therapy is something that must be part of this discussion. Uh, it's side effects to the patient, the side effects to the unborn baby are minimal and much less compared to any medication, especially those that your patient has just provided a form of refusal to. Electroconvulsive therapy. For test taking purposes, mood disorder during pregnancy gets ECT. That is, these are primary indications. Uh, from an academic perspective, there are five scenarios which if in a case vignette, ECT will be your single best answer. One of them we just got, what are the other four? Suicidality. So severe depression, suicidality, psychotic features. That's uh, two. Like the patient we had today, uh, refusal to eat. Catatonia. 
let's, let's call it catatonia, which is what we called it. Three, two more. One is a cube mania. A cube mania gets ECT. And then the fourth one is trip. It's patient preference. If they've, if they've heard the risks and benefits, even for the quote unquote garden variety depressive episode, and you review with them the side effects of the SSRI and the likelihood that they're going to respond, and they hear a similar discussion about ECT and choose ECT, they should be referred. Any final thoughts about Beetlejuice? We're good? All right, we're going to take a, a, brief, a brief intermission, come back, and then live on Zoom uh, with our case presentations.